Master of Planning students that are joining us this afternoon and all those who are watching via the YouTube. The first item on the Planning Advisory Committee agenda is the approval of minutes for March 21st, 20, 2023. What is your wish? So moved. Second. Moved and second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Grant reminded. Motion carried. First item on the agenda is the presentation from Master of Planning Students Managing Future Growth in Mount Uniac. And Rachel is going to give us an introduction. So Rachel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, the students in front of you are on the Master of Planning program at Dalhousie. They're in their last year, almost finished. I think this is the last kind of educational thing that they're doing right now. Um, as part of their program, they undertake a project on uh, for a client and they um, clients put forward proposals as to different projects that uh, we think the students would be interested in and that we would uh, have benefit in receiving. So uh, we submitted the project idea and the students decided that this was something they were interested in. And yeah, so they have prepared a study on managing future growth in Mount Uniac. And I'll let them introduce themselves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, welcome, Candice. Sorry I missed you when I introduced Mr. Balcom. Uh, who's speaking first? So I'll go first, then uh, my colleague Yong here, and then Emily, then uh, John. Oh, okay. Or maybe, yeah, if you want to get a shot there. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Oh. Okay. Maybe just unplug and refill your. You can just. Just in. Might not be. No, it might be on. Let's see. Is it rolling in now? We can. There you go. Yeah, just. There you go. I can tap you from there. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you uh, so much uh, for having us uh, this afternoon. Um, yes, you may have heard our mock consulting firm looked into ways to manage development in an unserviced part of uh, East Hans. Uh, Mount Uniac as part of our integrated uh, team project course at Dalhousie. So uh, first I'll just go over the agenda. As you can see on it, uh, we'll first provide an overview of the project to show uh, why and how we're discussing this topic and really provide background uh, information on the area, for which will be further explained by you know, demographic, spatial, and growth analyses on, about the area. And our experience of consultations for the project and uh, conducting a policy and document review and jurisdictional scan will then be discussed. We'll then uh, conclude with a discussion of what we uh, found and our recommendations. So I'll just uh, introduce ourselves here. Uh, my name is Michael Badanovich, and uh, we also have uh, John Gamey, Sagu Gong, Emily Patterson uh, here with us today. Uh, Jake Fenchuk and uh, Ning Lang couldn't be here today, unfortunately. And uh, yeah, as you're probably aware, our uh, client for the uh, presentation is the municipality of East Hand. So we've been in touch with the uh, manager of planning, uh, Rachel Gilbert, uh, throughout the project. Yeah, so just in terms of uh, the, the overview of the project, uh, we're first going to kind of look at the broader context of growth before really looking closer at uh, the specific area that we studied. We'll then go into more depth on the uh, goals and objectives of our project. 
<clears throat> yeah, so uh, here we see kind of broader uh, kind of context around the growth uh, in the province here. And it's uh, important to note that as you know, the province continues to grow, it's really important to consider where uh, that growth uh, is really being kind of concentrated or directed. Uh, there's actually decades high population growth uh, between 2016 and 2021, and just over two thirds of it actually occurred in uh, Halifax Regional Municipality or HRM. And uh, this really concentration of growth really has a, you know, carries some implications for areas, you know, adjacent to the, the fast growing ones, such as East Hance. <clears throat> and uh, they're all kind of just go a little bit closer into the area here. Um, if we keep, keep the population growth in mind, there's you know, various development pressures, which are making an impact uh, across East Hance. And you know, it's important to note that uh, East Hance uh, has actually created uh, growth management areas for growth management areas or GMAs to really kind of manage growth and direct growth in certain areas in order for it to be sustainable, compact, and economically uh, viable. And the Mount Uniac uh, GMA is uh, one such area, and it's actually the only one of the four that is unserviced by municipal water and wa wastewater services. <clears throat> And uh, yeah, so just getting to our uh, project goal um, here, I think the, the big uh, takeaway from it is that the municipality is really hoping that this project will help determine if uh, the current growth management policy uh, framework is really sufficient for guiding future growth in Mount Uniac, or if maybe newer or more innovative uh, land use arrangement or policies you know, should be considered. And new findings and recommendations from this project could help inform a, a future uh, secondary planning strategy for Mount Uniac. And so you can see here, the goal was met through these uh, three objectives here. And if we look at our uh, research methods here, they were designed really through a mixed methods approach, you know, which was really conducted over three phases as uh, demonstrated on the chart here. Uh, so first we want to really quantitatively uh, really study kind of background information about the area and then really kind of quality, you know, qualitatively uh, attain more information about the kind of local context and of that in uh, similar jurisdictions as well as related subject matter. And from there, we kind of developed our uh, recommendations. Uh, so from here, I'm going to kind of jump into our kind of analysis sections, and I'll start off with our demographic uh, profile here. Uh, so first, we'll go over growth rates, then kind of dive into further into some information around the population, household, and uh, housing in the area there. <clears throat> and um, yeah, it's uh, of, of note, a lot of these stats look at uh, the UNIAC uh, Rodon um, aggregate uh, dissemination area, and the data is, is, of, is, at, <coughs> is as uh, of uh, February 2023, sorry. And uh, so we see here in terms of growth in the area here, um, there's uh, about 238 uh, people moved into the area from uh, 2016 to 2021. This represented a population increase just over 5%. So as a result, there's been an increase in the number of occupied uh, dwellings in the region here. And uh, if we look kind of further into the characteristics of the population, one really key finding we found is that there's really been a gradual increase in uh, the number of uh, smaller sized households and non-census families here. And if we look into um, age here, um, we've kind of noticed that among the more senior age cohorts, uh, we've seen kind of some reductions in those that are actually just under the uh, life average life expectancy for Nova Scotia, which kind of suggests that uh, many seniors are probably leaving the area and they're retirement uh, years. And as well, there's also been a significant uh, growth in kind of more working age populations, uh, which could possibly include those who are starting a family or about buying their first home there. And if you look at the actual uh, housing stock here, as uh, you can see there, the vast majority of housing stock in the area are single detached homes. In regards to the other 13%, uh, most of them tend to be uh, mobile homes. There's a mobile park, home park in the area, for instance, and only about 2% of dwellings in the region are uh, really composed of uh, semi-detached uh, homes or row houses or uh, apartments there. And uh, this, um, so that's, that's kind of an interesting uh, thing to really kind of attach to kind of the demographic analysis there. You can really kind of see if maybe there's not as many, you know, kind of housing options or choices necessarily for, the, for, for example, for seniors who might want to wish to age in place or maybe for you know, smaller households to really obtain, you know, suitable housing options. So that was kind of a big kind of takeaway we kind of got from the demographic analysis to take a look there, but I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, my colleague Gong here to kind of cover more of the spatial analysis. Okay, thank you, Mike. Okay, thank you, Mike. Uh, let's, now let's move to the spatial analysis section, which includes uh, transportation analysis and uh, land use analysis. So first, this, as this map shows, in it is the hands to major 
Highway Corridors, Highway 101 and Highway 102 are connected to Halifax, the economic and population center of Nova Scotia, which impacts the development and economic growth. The proximity of Halif of Eastham of Eastham to Halifax are resulting in densely pop populated area near the highways. Therefore, therefore, all four all four GMAs are located along these corridors, and Mount Uniac is the only GMA uh, located along with Highway 101, while other three are located along with Highway 102. Then we an analyze the connect connectivity of the Mount Uniac GMA with the rest of East Hands and the neighboring municipalities. As the left map shows, the traffic volume on both highway corridors is higher on the Halifax side than in the East Ham side. But inside of the inside traffic within the three GMAs on the on the east is much higher than the within uh, Mount Uniac because the, those GMAs are well connected and have more interactives. And as this right map shows, the connection between the Mount Uniac GMA and other three GMA along with uh, Highway 102 are very weak, with no highway or trunks connecting them. The Mount Uniac GMA is. However, the Mount United GMA is well connected to the Halifax and the Windsor. And the closest and the largest GMA in the east hand is, is 15 kilometers away from Mount Uniac. As a result, residents from the Mount Uniac GMA will often have to travel to Halifax or Windsor for goods or services. This lack of connectivity between those GMAs along between the GMAs also indicates that it's difficult to extend the current infrastructure network from the east to Mount Uniac. And then we reviewed the current land use zoning. So this slide presents the land coverage of different zones in Mount Uniac GMA. The rural use zone, which accounts for 36% 30, of the GMA's area, is intended to allow for agricultural and low density residential use. In addition, the R1 and R2 zone are also are also occupied also occupied significant land area in the GMA. Therefore, most of the land in the GMA is designated for is designated to foresting low density low density residents, especially the single detached home. The village home zone permits higher density residential and commercial uses, but is primarily comprised of single detached home and small business. The business park, regional, commercial, and industrial commercial zones planned as a commercial center as the axis of the Highway 101 have limited potential for mixed use development due to the requirement for a connection to municipal water and wastewater services. Next, we conduct a growth analysis, uh, including the current development trade review, population forecasting, and land development capacity analysis under different development scenarios. To begin, we reviewed the subdivision application data from 2016 to 2023 and found that the number of credit number decreased by 28% per year from 2016 to 2020. However, since 2020, the lot creation rate has increased dram dramatically. The growth rate is three times faster, and with 150 lots created for the devel for development in 2020 alone, in 2022 alone. And this map shows the recent development in the four communities around Mount Uniac GMA. We can find that most development occurred within the GMA boundary, but some developments also occurred around these lakes. However, we found that there is one development occur adjacent to the GMA boundary that is not aligned with the GMA's policy goal. In addition, the dominant format of those developments in the GMA is single detached home, and the lot size is significantly larger than the minimal lot size requirement, which is about 4.8x per lot on average. Um, for the land capacity analysis, we estimate the the underdevelopment land area. As this map shows, there is 3,100 uh, 3, acres of undevelopment land within the GMA zoned for residential uses. We then estimate the current population of the Mount Uniac GMA and create three different goal scenarios to uh, understand how the GMA can accommodate the continued growth. Our projection shows that if the GMA maintaining the current growth rate, the population is projected to reach 2,700 
93 by 2041, meaning 581 additional residents would be added to the GMA's population. By contrast, the GMA's population in 2041 is roughly 1.5 times the size of the GMA's current population on the strongest, on the stronger scenario. Even under the moderate scenario, an additional 278 residents would need to be accommodated by 2041. Therefore, the GMA will require increased residential, residential development to accommodate, the, accommodate this growth. Further, increased commercial and community service would likely be required to meet the local demands. We then estimate how this um, current residential land will be consumed under three development patterns based on the strong and normal population growth scenario. Our funding shows that Mount Union will run out of residential land in 2046 if we continue with the current development pattern of creating huge single detached lots. Even under the normal scenario, the current development pattern will consume most of the land capacity by 2051. However, if we could reduce the minimal lot size requirement by introducing some innovative services, such as a class system we will mention later, we could slow down this land consumption and provide more development opportunities, accom accommodating more residents within Mount Uniac. Now I will pass it over to our colleague, Emily. Awesome, thank you, Gong. Um, now we're going to be moving into some more of the qualitative analysis of the report, uh, starting with the local consultation and policy and document review. Um, so with our local consultation, though small, we were able to speak with, uh, do seven different interviews with planners and local area counselors. And from these, we developed three main themes that really came out of those. Uh, the first being preservation of community character. There's a lot of value in the character of the area in that they value the green space, the access to nature, uh, and then the existing development patterns as part of their general life in the area. And that's something that needs to be considered, especially in looking at that second trend, which is development trends and local housing needs. So a consideration of how those local uh, value for community and nature can be accommodated within the need for greater housing diversity, but also within the increasing impact of development on those living in the area. And then finally, there's challenges within current policy. So while there is opportunity within the current uh, planning uh, in the area, there are challenges to creating different forms of housing, and then additionally within creating more services and uh, options within the area. Uh, we also conducted a large policy and document review of all the different documents within um, the municipality. Uh, from this, we pulled out three main themes that came up again and again, which was uh, so the intended growth pattern. So again, this need to balance community character and the need for new housing types when we consider development patterns going forward. Um, the second being limits on growth in unserviced areas. Uh, so there's a large lot size for residential and commercial uses needed when there is uh, on-site servicing needs to be accommodated on those lots. And this creates a bit of a barrier for mixed use development when all of that servicing needs to be accommodated on the lot and uh, poses a bit of a challenge when we're trying to expand and create new options within an area. And then the third being infrastructure. So there's limits and opportunities. So there's opportunities for alternative systems and servicing provisions, um, including the use of like a comprehensive development district. Uh, but this can be a challenge and an opportunity and that it may be hard for some to pursue and it may pose a bit of a challenge for people trying to pursue new development opportunities in the area. So moving into our jurisdictional scan, this is a very large area, uh, section of our report. So this is going to be more of a high level overview of uh, the things that we looked at throughout it, covering um, how cluster septic systems work, how they're enabled and managed in practice, and then the applicability within the Nova Scotia context. So while we began with a broad initial scan of planning documents, one approach to achieving growth in unserviced areas uh, emerged relatively quickly as a viable use of community septic or cluster systems. Um, so cluster systems generally refer to a system that serves multiple dwellings, properties, uh, structures, and that it is a system that is not just for one lot and one dwelling. Um, so we wanted to look further at this and then look at how these systems are enabled both in policy and how they're managed in practice. So what is a cluster septic system or a cluster centralized system? They're centralized wastewater systems that can service various types of developments. So while they operate like private on-site systems, they rely on a centralized outlet of wastewater. They can be modular systems, they can be miniature systems of a normal 
what you'd see at a larger scale sewage treatment plant, or they can be a, simply a larger scale system of an individual septic system. So there's many different ways that they can exist, but in, in some, they allow for smaller minimum lot sizes in unserviced areas and more compact development patterns. So a single system serving a variety of dwellings and a variety of properties. From this, we wanted to look at some of these, uh, how these systems are managed in policy throughout all of these different jurisdictions. And we found that planning strategies and land use bylaws can be used to enable and regulate cluster systems. Um, so mostly municipalities choose to define what a cluster septic system means in that area and how it is, what type of systems are generally considered for that area. So it differs between um, different regions. Uh, they regulate the construction standards. So what type of system is being constructed, to what degree does it need to be constructed Engineering constraints for that area may be different than in other ones. They establish management responsibility. So who's going to take on the management of this system going forward? Is it going to be public? Is it going to be private? Um, is it going to be the municipality that manages it? And also a development of new minimum lot sizes. So a consideration of how lot sizes can be shrunk when you are having servicing taken off of this individual lot. Uh, from this, we looked at the two pathways for management, so municipal management and private management. In municipal management, generally, municipal management is granted through a bylaw process in which a municipality gains authority to own, manage, and maintain a system. This often happens through some sort of transfer agreement in which after a system is constructed by a private entity, it has to meet a, a series of considerations before it can be passed off or signed off to a municipality such that you get a system that's in good working order and you know that it meets all of the qualifications to continue working into the future. There's usually a user fee model that's developed as part of this within the internal capacity of the municipality, uh, usually a lot for a frontage fee for all of the properties that would be connected onto a system like this. It would allow for fiscal responsibility going forward and to plan out what the horizons would be need for maintenance and management and fees. And then in private management, the maintenance is uh, paid for by the condo corporation or a landowner. Um, so it could be in the terms of a rental building or a condo building. Uh, the level of ownership and maintenance is then going to be dependent on that management group going forward. So uh, at this point, we wanted to really think about this more in practice in the Nova Scotian context. So we looked at provincial regulatory documents for wastewater management. Um, and currently, under those regulations, uh, only individual property owners uh, can connect, cannot connect to a system unless it's under a condominium corporation or a municipal development. So if a series of property owners uh, all wanted to have their own cluster system on, like, say, six properties on a street. They currently would not be able to do that. It's not regulated. It's not allowed through the regulations provincially right now. The province doesn't like to see private management outside of municipal or a condo corporation just so they can see accountability. But there's an opportunity through wastewater management districts that allow for municipalities to take over, own, operate, and maintain private on-site systems or cluster systems. So we started really looking at wastewater management districts as an opportunity uh, for rural municipalities in Nova Scotia. So while wastewater management districts provide an opportunity for municipalities to facilitate cluster systems, they are not necessarily intended for that purpose. Uh, in the statement of provincial interest, wastewater management districts and cluster systems are noted that they should be considered where on-site systems are experiencing problems. Uh, this poses a challenge in that regulations do not intend for these system for a wastewater management district to be used to foster growth. Um, or non-traditional development patterns. So this challenge is created in that it's more difficult to facilitate this type of change when there isn't direction within policy for it to be used for innovative patterns of growth as opposed to it being seen as a, a solution to fixing problems. Um, so this is something that we kind of explored more in our recommendations finally as well. But to really conceptualize this a little bit, we wanted to look at a subdivision from uh, the past few years and think about how it could be seen in a little bit of more of a, a reconceptualizing of uh, lot sizes. So this was a subdivision from 2022. It was 56.9 acres, uh, rezoned for residential use, and 35 new lots were created with an average lot size of about 1.6 acres. We wanted to reimagine this site using a cluster system. Uh, we used a general model for estimating what the size of the septic field. This is the reserve area in the dark green there. Um, and then you can see on the same, we reduced the minimum lot sizes by a, a small amount to allow for 44 single detached homes, 14 townhouses, and two eight-unit apartment buildings that would be served by a cluster system. As you can see, it also has a significant area that's reserved in green space, and it allows more space to develop in a little bit more of a dense compact and allowing for more housing options. Now I'm going to pass it to John for a final discussion and recommendations. OK, 
Okay, great. Thanks, Emily. Uh, so for the rest of the presentation, I'm going to focus on our analysis of the different findings we made and then how that analysis led us to making our final recommendations. So if we were going to sum up our findings in one blurb, it would be that while Mount Uniac can be expected to continue growing, uh, achieving growth patterns that are both needed and desirable is going to be very difficult under current policy frameworks. So we expect Mount Uniac to continue growing for three main reasons. Uh, one, due to its geographical proximity to the HRM. Uh, two, because growth is both occurring and being encouraged in both the HRM and Nova Scotia. And three, because Mount Uniac has an abundance of developable land. Uh, however, for this growth to accommodate a variety of household sizes, ages, and income levels, Mount Uniac will need a greater variety of dwelling types, as well as increased commercial, recreational, and institutional development. Uh, so due to the policy constraints that exist as a result of Mount Uniac being unserviced, realizing those types of development is going to be very difficult. However, as our jurisdictional scan did highlight, cluster systems do offer a possible solution to achieving these development types in non-service lands. Uh, in addition, our analysis of Nova Scotia's current on-site wastewater regulations found that while limited in application, avenues for using cluster systems to support uh, non-traditional development patterns in unserviced parts of the province are possible. So with that in mind, our recommendations and the development of our recommendations is really centered around how East Hans could use uh, cluster systems as a tool for achieving the development patterns that are needed right now. So in addition to that, these recommendations also included what our team identified as some complementary research efforts and other projects that uh, would need to be explored. Uh, so ultimately, uh, three recommendations came out of this project. So first, we recommended that East Hans uh, enables and encourages the use of cluster septic systems in a secondary planning strategy for Mount Uniac. Uh, second, we recommended that East Hans expands its growth management study of Mount Uniac. And then lastly, uh, we recommended that East Hans explores provincial interest in a collaborative uh, pilot project where cluster systems are used to achieve these, like I said earlier, non-traditional development patterns in unserviced parts of the province. Uh, so let's start with the first recommendation here. Um, so many of the action items that stem from this one are really related to policy statements and bylaw provisions. So for example, at a very base level, we are recommending here that cluster systems are just defined in the secondary plan, as well as in the relevant land use bylaw. Um, we also recommended that policy is established stating that any type of cluster system approved by the Department of Environment is to be permitted in Mount Uniac, and that private developers are responsible for cluster system construction. And the rationale behind, rationale behind that item is just because uh, it would very likely be too costly and time consuming for the municipality to set its own standards for these cluster systems. And this typically appears to align with how cluster systems are being built in the province right now. Uh, another item here is that uh, we recommended the municipalities develop policy statements in the secondary plan that would assert that cluster systems are enabled to counteract sprawl, uh, use land efficiently and diversify the local housing stock. Here we just thought it was really important to kind of enshrine the true rationale for uh, cluster systems within that secondary plan. And then finally, we recommended that new minimum lot sizes uh, be set for lots that are serviced by cluster systems in Mount Uniac, and that additional supportive policies are developed that would kind of direct maybe a mid to larger scale developments or subdivisions serviced by cluster systems into lands that the municipality deems uh, most suitable. Now you may have noticed here that we didn't recommend that East Hans develops like a policy or bylaw that would establish itself as a potential owner and manager of cluster systems within that recommendation. So if we move to our second recommendation, I can hope to shed a little bit more light on that. Uh, so our second recommendation is to expand the growth management study to really to cover areas of the project um, we were unable to investigate. Uh, so first we recommended that the municipality really commissions a study into ground and soil conditions uh, in the Mount Uniac growth management area. Because as of right now, we were unable to find much uh, information or have any knowledge of land suitability for the installation of cluster systems, particularly those that would actually service this, these kinds of like medium to larger scale developments. Uh, our second action item for expanding the study was for the municipality to conduct an internal investigation into its uh, capacity to both own and manage cluster systems itself. So as it currently stands, we do not believe that the municipality is in a position to own and manage these systems. And before that step is actually taken, there'd be significant research into costs, what funding models would be used, and the staffing levels that would be needed to actually take on such a role would really need to be conducted. Uh, so having said all that, um, if proven, proven to be feasible, we do believe that municipal ownership and management of cluster systems would offer East Hans the ability to play a more direct role in how uh, development occurs in Mount Uniac. And we really believe that through the establishment of a wastewater management district bylaw for that purpose, the municipality could really seek out opportunities with developers to build these kind of compact, diverse, and more mixed use developments that are serviced by cluster systems that are then owned and operated by the municipality. 
And by having the municipality as that central entity uh, responsible for the system's performance, we think that concerns around private mismanagement could very much be mitigated and the municipality could really be playing that traditional role of being a provider of infrastructure. So our third recommendation now will um, look a little bit more closely about how we think this could actually be realized. Uh, so as Emily did note earlier, uh, wastewater management district bylaws, while they do allow for municipalities to, again, take over, own and operate on-site systems, including cluster systems, uh, WMDs are really framed in provincial policy and legislation as these kind of municipal solutions to failing systems rather than as tools to fostering um, these kind of efficient and more compact uh, development patterns. So our assessment of both the provincial and local growth context in Mount Uniac led us to recommend that East Hans explores a, uh, you know, the province's interest in a pilot project that would really see these, the concept of wastewater management districts reconceptualized as a tool for fostering uh, non-traditional development patterns in unserviced parts of Nova Scotia. And we really believe that this collaborative project, which would involve East Hans, the province, and a private developer, uh, could really be beneficial for both the province and uh, East Hans. Uh, so with provincial support and subsidy, East Hans could really take that chance to explore the ownership and management of cluster systems with a lot less risk, while also getting the chance to better understand the fiscal capacity and staffing levels it would need to actually operate these systems. And if successful, this project could allow land to be developed a lot more efficiently on a site in East Hans, which would again allow for that higher number and greater diversity of residential dwelling types, which we've very much now established that are much in need. And of course, if successful as well, this could really uh, serve to generate increased property tax revenue, of course. Uh, for the province, we really think that the success of this type of pilot project could have implications for future growth management in unserviced areas. Uh, given that there's an estimated 45% of the province that is currently unserviced, uh, we really think that innovative servicing techniques will need to be explored if the province wants to reach its uh, growth goals by 2060. And you know, if the uh, use of cluster systems under this kind of municipally owned and provincially supported model can be demonstrated to be successful. We really think this model could be possibly expanded and then exported to other um, unserviced parts of the province to help support that future growth that we know is uh, coming. Uh, so that's all we've got for today for our presentation. Uh, we're happy if we have any time here to answer any questions or take any comments, but we'd like to thank you all again. Thank you all for the presentation. Any questions from council? Councilor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, for three years I've been after staff for something <laughs> to, to be enabled to grow Mount Uniac. And I was thinking, like, why do we need a study? Well, I know I've been in Mount Uniac for 30 years. The other councillor was born in Mount Uniac, so why do we need that study? And after I started reading this, piece of art you guys did. I couldn't even stop. I had to read the whole thing. And I want to thank you for all your work. It, it was, it is amazing. I, I couldn't say anything more than that. And to find the solution, like I was thinking, okay, we could throw an R3 there and let, and let the developer deal with the septic and stuff. But you guys found everything I was looking for the last probably five, six years. And, in less than two months. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Anything else? The Deputy Warden Perry. First of all, I'd like to thank you guys for your report and your presentation it was very good on time and, and very well and clearly presented. Um, it, yes, you, you definitely highlighted uh, a possible option uh, for the on-service area and, and Mount Uniac was the area you looked at but there's lots of very outlying areas, even here, just outside the growth management area of the corridor, as well as a lot of areas in the rural um, parts of East Hants that might benefit from a similar uh, opportunity to develop like this in enhancing some of the small community cores. So you've given us lots to think about, and you've given us lots that I would think will spur some further discussion. Uh, your recommendations are very clear and, and, and show a bit of a path for us uh, if we choose to go that direction uh, for consultation and further study. So for that, I'd like to thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Councillor Rhino. Yes, uh, it's quite a presentation, but basically for me, all the, what this is is to put more people on less land. And that's basically what it is. And so I would be interested in finding out is, is the population, current population, of Mount Uniac, are they asking for this? 
Uh, what, what, what's the population's feelings? Uh, do they want more growth? Do they want this? So uh, that's what uh, I'd be interested in, in, uh, in hearing at some point down the road. Thank you. Yeah, that was in our recommendations was to look to actually speak very broadly with the community. Um, but some of the things that we were able to draw out of that was there's a lot of seniors leaving. And I guess for us, that is really concerning as you spend your whole life in a community and then there's nowhere for you to go when you want something slightly smaller than a single family dwelling. So even if it's not considering the broad population growth, it's just even accommodating your the existing population within that too is a part of some of this growth strategy as well. Thank you for that. I asked follow up on that thing. Follow up, uh, Councilor. So, did you? Was there any discussion with the general population, or was there any discussion with uh, developers themselves? Because I see in there you talked to councilors and, and some other people there, but you didn't this, specifically mention developers, and you didn't mention the uh, look at the broad public. So, I guess was that taken into consideration? It was not within the scope of it for the school project for the timeline that we had. Mm -hmm. um, we would have loved to have spoken more broadly with the community and with developers as well, especially if they're interested in these type of steps going forward. I'm um, just not within it. Within the recommendations and the limitations, it does note that that consultation needs to be undertaken at a, a much broader scale. Well, not being a counselor from the area, I'm going to have to rely on the counselors there and their, their knowledge of the area. But you know, as is what's happening and seeing what's happening in this quarter area now, it's, it's, it's uh, with the, the people that have been here for quite some time, it's, it's not going over very well. So I'm just trying to look at the, look the long range picture, picture and, and uh, you know, uh, is it such a great thing to put more people on less land? That's to be determined again. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Rhino. Councillor Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Councillor Rhino, as a councillor of the area, I can respond uh, to, your, to your question. Uh, first of all, uh, those gentlemen and women, they cannot trace every senior that move, but the number shows that mostly the most people who are leaving are seniors. And as a councillor of the area, I can tell you exactly those seniors come to every single event happening in Mount Uniac. They keep their relation to the area. They even come to the church in Mount Uniac, to the hairdresser. To, they, they didn't change anything except the location, and that tells you they only move because there's nothing for them. Is that all, Councilor Musa? Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Eisner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Um, on the cluster systems, uh, now on the maintenance, would there be a program, like because these will be all used on s separate residents, so who would have to, like it's municipality will have to look after it or? or? I guess, yeah, so that would uh, depend based on which course you want to take. Like we've we've put forward that option if the municipality did want to do that, but there'd be, need to be a lot more research done into that. Like, yeah, and the way we've seen it operated in a lot of other municipalities and jurisdictions from our jurisdictional scan was that they essentially kind of function as their own little mini wastewater treatment plants but they're not like the classic like central one that you'd have here in uh, like the core and they're essentially owned and operated like in the same form or fashion but just on that smaller scale with that cluster style system so different uh, technical components but similar management structure just in a different geographical region will it be owned by the owner of it's strictly a municipality they will have to look after that. So right now in Nova Scotia, it's typically all done privately. There's a couple of cases, I believe, in the HRM that have they've started looking at owning it themselves. But yeah, everywhere else, it's typically a condo style um, corporation that will own and manage the cluster system. But what we've read through like a lot of the literature was that this can often lead to problems with like the private uh, mismanagement of these systems, like things like maintenance and uh, uh, just general management aren't right. really happening at a there's not as much accountability, let's say, when the private uh, sector isn't taking care of it. So we've seen uh, better cases when municipalities take over and kind of take on that role of being the provider in the, of the infrastructure. These systems do have a better kind of chance at being successful uh, for long term, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councilor Eisner. 
Councilor Tingley. Uh, through the chair, uh, thank you for your report. Uh, my question is actually to John. Um, the uh, system on Cranberry Court in Enfield, is that considered a cluster system? Um, through you, uh, Mr. Chair, they have shared wells, and uh, I can't remember if they, it's condominiumized, I know that. They, even though they're individual lots, it's condominiumized. Um, I can't remember if they're actually shared septic, it's not, so it's just a shared wells in that case. There, we do, um, Cottage Country might be the only development where we have uh, cluster septic systems, and again, that's done in a condominium corporation. Okay, thanks very much. Is that all, Councillor? That's it. Thank you. S seeing no other uh, council, Austin, looking for questions or answers. I want to thank you four for coming in. Thank you. I wish you well in your studies and in the job market going I forward. It. You're welcome. <clears throat> The next item on the agenda is the PLN 20-001 Elmsdale Lumber Company Containerized Biochar Facility. Debbie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My computer's not restarting here. Just give me a moment. Take your time. Uh, sorry about that. I guess I have to restart. Might have a connection if you. Uh, Rachel's going to bring it up, and I'll just use her laptop while I restart. Plugged in, I'm not sure why it's now oh, there we go. Maybe. So I'm still Lumber Company Limited. So the original application was submitted um, to, um, to the municipality in August of 2020. In December of 2022, Elmsdale Lumber Company Limited updated the application. And the purpose of the updated application is to permit a containerized biochar production facility to allow observation for future consideration of a larger biochar facility. The containerized biochar facility will have to comply with the requirements of an industrial approval permit, and the containerized facility is proposed to be located on the existing lumber mill site. So here we have the subject properties. Um, there's two of them here. The one where the mill is located is completely zoned industrial commercial, and the uh, one 
that kind of surrounds the lumber mill here is split zoned. It has industrial, commercial, and R2. Um, the total of the two properties in size is 23 hectares, and adjacent uses and zones include um, institutional use, which is where the elementary school is located, and also R1 is a part of the subdivision here in Elmwood. And uh, we have across the street mixed uh, village core, and we have high risk and moderate risk floodplain, and then we have some uh, R2T at the extension of Tyler Street. So the purpose of the application is to substantially amend an existing development agreement to permit the containerized biochar production facility. Under the existing development agreement, the applicant is permitted to operate the lumber mill um, on the subject property up to a maximum of 7,061 uh, square meters. Due to the potential of the proposed biochar production facility being obnoxious, the existing development agreement is required to be substantially amended. The containerized biochar production unit is one-tenth the scale of the originally proposed biochar production facility, so it's proposed to be approximately 1,200 square feet. Um, enabling the development of the containerized facility will allow professional engineers to observe the facility and scale the results to, cons to allow consideration of a future 5,000 um, square meter biochar facility at a future date. But this would also require an, uh, a development agreement. The intention would be that the municipal development officer would receive documentation at the eight month mark on the engineer's observations. Um, applicant uh, proceeding with the applicant is also proposing to proceed currently with the mapping amendments to allow the future consideration of the larger biochar protection facility by a development agreement. Mapping amendments are not required to be approved in order to allow for the existing development agreement to be amended to allow for consideration of the containerized facility. Um, and mapping amendments are not appealable to the Nova Scotia Utility Review Board, whereas the substantial amendment to the existing development agreement is appealable to the Nova Scotia Utility and Review Board. So under the terms of the substantial amendment to the existing development agreement, the total combined floor area of all buildings will need to be increased to accommodate the proposed containers. And in considering the application, council shall take into consideration the goal of the industrial commercial designation, the policies of the industrial, commer uh, industrial commercial designation and policy IM10 to determine if the application is in the best interest of the municipality. So an environmental study assessment is not required for the proposal proposed application. However, an industrial approval is required by the province. An industrial approval considers a whole range of items such as noise, emissions, effluent, dust, and other items. As part of the industrial approval, the applicant also requires confirmation from the municipality that the proposed use is a permitted land use. Citizen engagement. So a public information meeting for the containerized biochar facility was held on March 7th, 2023, and notes have been included in the staff report. Uh, concerns raised by residents include concerns about any possible noise and or emissions from the uh, containerized facility, asked if biochar production was taking place in other, any other communities, and discussion about feedstock and ensuring that the feedstock would come only from the lumber mill itself. Uh, staff also sent out questionnaires, and um, those questionnaire responses have been, uh, for the updated application, have been provided to Planning Advisory Committee for the review. Um, we've also included the questionnaire responses from the old from the original part of the application, uh, just for your review as well. There were 614 questionnaire forms were mailed, and 20 responses were received. And the recommendation is to give initial consideration to substantially amending a development agreement and to authorize staff to schedule a public hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Any questions from council? Councilor Head. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would move the recommended motion that's presented. Second. It's, it's moved and second. Do you as you wish. Question. Questions being called, we'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed 10 to 2 with 
myself and Senator Gordon Cole voting nay. Next item on the agenda is bylaw P1300, blasting bylaw Rachel. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So at their meeting in January 2023, council passed the following motion, which is to move to, that council direct staff to bring back a report to introduce blasting bylaw in East Hants. This draft bylaw does not cover blasting in the quarry as this is covered under the activities designation regulations. And there are also blasting safety regulations which are made under section 82 of the Occupational Health and Safety Act. And these regulations would still be relevant to blasting which is covered by the draft bl blasting bylaw. And the draft blasting bylaw does not replicate the provincial regulations um, except one area where it, uh, the uh, the municipal draft blast in Bible by law requires a blaster um, for blasting. Uh, Halifax Regional Municipality, they have a blast in by law and this is enabled under the Halifax Charter. So planning staff have confirmed with the municipal solicitor that the council does have the jurisdiction to create a blast in by law under powers in the Municipal Government Act. So as mentioned, HRM has a blast in bylaw, and they've had that since 2000, November 2003. They also have engineering technologists on staff who administer the bylaw, and their role is identified as inspector in the bylaw, and the draft, the HRM blast in bylaw was included as an appendix to the staff report. These inspectors have some experience of blasting, but they are not certified at this time. And there is an active role for the inspectors in the administration of their HRM bylaw. And just some statistics there. Um, I reached out to someone at HRM, and they confirmed that in 2022, they had issued 52 blasting permits. So the following is a summary of the HRM blasting bylaw. Um, so they have blasting permit required, hours of blasting, limits on noise and vibration, a pre-blast survey is carried out on nearby properties. A notice is delivered to identify property owners prior to the commencement of blasting. Blasting is under the care of the control of the blaster. Drilling dust control, blast monitoring to be carried out. Submission of records, administration section, rights and remedies. And they have an Appendix A, which is the requirements for monitoring, and an Appendix B, which is certificate of compliance for blast monitoring reports. And I did look to see if there are any other blasting bylaws in Nova Scotia, and I couldn't identify any. So planning staff have drafted a blasting bylaw using the HRM1 as a template. However, East Hans doesn't have the same resources to administer or enforce the same bylaw that HRM has, um, as we don't have inspectors who have knowledge and experience of blasting. Um, and as I noted, HRM actively administers the bylaw. For example, um, one area that they actively administer is an HRM, they can allow for an increase in the area where a pre-blast survey is required or can identify where a public meeting will be required. And there's also a section regarding a security deposit being required to deal with blast monitoring if the HRM don't feel that the monitoring is being done um, uh, effectively. So these decisions by the inspector would be informed by their knowledge and experience. And as I said, East Hans don't have that right now. So based on that, planning staff have drafted the bylaw with the intent that the applicant and the qualified monitor are required to confirm their adherence to the bylaw. Um, and on that basis, the draft East Hans blasting bylaw includes blasting permit required, hours of blasting, which mirrors the community standards bylaw, limits on noise and vibration, a pre-blast survey is carried out on identified nearby properties prior to blasting. A notice is delivered to identify property owners prior to the commencement of blasting. And this will be um, prior to the start, and it doesn't mean a notice is given before each blast. Um, blasting is under the care and control of a blaster. Drilling dust control, blast monitoring to be carried out by an independent person, and they, these are called qualified monitor. Um, a submission of records, administration section, rights and remedies, and then again an Appendix A, uh, which includes requirements for monitoring and reporting of sound and vibration, and Appendix B, Certificate of Compliance for Blast Monitoring Reports. 
Uh, most of the responsibility for the compliance with the draft bylaw is put on the applicant, blaster, and the qualified monitor. There are still obligations on the municipality, but those are intended to ensure the application is complete and contains all the required information, but the liability is put onto the others. Um, the municipal solicitor has commented that any certification made by a person held out to have ex expertise in the thing being certified or represented, uh, for example, a qualified monitor can be relied upon by the municipality, and if that later turns out to be negligent, the municipality cannot be held liable. And there is the section of the Municipal Government Act that uh, provides that um, statement regarding liability. So staff recommend that a letter in requesting comments on the draft bylaw be sent to stakeholders. Um, stakeholders should include developers who build in East Hants, and also um, consultation be held with blasters and qualified monitors where they can be identified. And this may help identify any challenges they see with working under the regulations of the bylaw. So staff don't have the experience and knowledge of blasting to really understand whether this blasting bylaw um, first, it, it, the HRM one is based on 2003 bylaw. Um, so is that the most current um, way to administer blasting? And also, um, does this does this draft blasting bylaw make sense um, to people who actually might be blasting in East Hants? So staff strongly recommend that this consultation be undertaken. However, um, the alternatives are that PAC and council may decide not to support the adoption of a blasting bylaw, or PAC and council may support a simpler bylaw with minimal requirements. And this will require less administration by municipal, municipal staff. And this could include hours of blasting, pre-blast surveys carried out on identified nearby properties, and notices delivered to identified property owners prior to the commencement of blasting, blasting under the care and control of a blaster, drilling dust control, rights and remedies appropriate to a simpler bylaw. And I made a note of the things, the main things that wouldn't be included if this was the approach that was taken. And a simpler bylaw would not include monitoring. Um, there would be no maximum noise and no maximum particle velocity. Um, and because without the monitoring, you don't know whether they've actually exceeded the, the um, noise or particle velocity. So a simpler bylaw with these requirements would enable property owners in the nearby area to have information in which would assist them in a baseline in which to understand what impact the blasting is having on their property. And for property owners, this may be challenging, however, to take action following potential damage to a property without information on the vibration created by the blasting. The draft bylaw as presented to PAC includes a requirement for monitoring information, which isn't included in the, the list of things in the simpler bylaw. So the recommendation for staff is to direct staff to consult with the stakeholder community on the draft blasting bylaw. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rachel. Any questions from council? What did you wish? Deputy Warden Perry. Thank you. Th through you to staff, when you were looking at the judicial scan and, and looking at the blasting bylaw, um, was there anything in any of the uh, documentation about impact on wells and, and water? Because there's been lots of cases where blasting has occurred, it fracks the water table, and all of a sudden you have a lot of people losing their water. Was was any of that contained in part of the uh, judicial scan? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So yes, the, I mentioned the pre-blast survey. So within, um, there's a formula that's in the blasting bylaw that indicates based on the weight, um, the charge weight, how far that pre-blast survey will um, cover. And as part of that survey, the, uh, w the current condition of the well, um, age and condition of the well, and also a bacterial and general chemical analysis are performed on water from the well before blasting has commenced. So there's the condition of the well, and then there's the actual well water itself. So that information will be, um, will be there'll be a baseline before the blasting occurs. Okay, and just to follow on to that, um, does the bylaw in their state, I know the municipality is not liable, but does it then identify the blaster will be liable um, in the event that any of these things have gone the wrong way. And, and the reason I bring this up is there's been instances in the past uh, in my community and residents have come to me over them many, many times, things that happened 10, 15 years ago where blasting occurred, the foundations were cracked, or 
Do they lost their wells and they tried to go after the blaster of the company and the company then put them on to the company that hired them and went back and back and forth. The next thing you know, they're trying to fight an uphill battle against a large corporation that nobody will identify who is actually liable. So, so that's something that I feel when, when somebody is blasting, especially like when this, when this came up in council for discussion, I mean, we, we were looking at blasting adjacent to residential communities or in a residential area. Um, because that, that's literally what is impacting the most is, you know, you have subdivisions, you have multiple homeowners close to an area, and if they're expanding or doing whatever, um, it can have a dire effect on the existing homes that, that, that are there. So we, we really want to make sure that whichever way we go, we protect the uh, people who are there and also um, clearly lay out a plan so blasting can take place because there's lots of areas in the province, uh, my, my community especially, where bedrock is is prevalent and we had a case uh, earlier uh, last fall where there was blasting going to take place and some of the community members were concerned because notif notification was only given by a day and through consultation with the developer uh, he put it off for four days so the residents could take that time get their pictures of their foundations and, and, and get their water test and get, and get it done and that's a good partner that that did that out of the willingness um, to be good a good steward in the community but that's not always the case so we need to make sure however we go forward that you know re residents are protected and uh, you know the municipality will be protected but residents are protected going forward to know that if something happens to their home and something's been done they have a way forward thank you mr. chair I can answer some of those points Go ahead. Um, so the the bylaw itself doesn't say that the liability is on the blaster or the monitor but essentially it would be the applicant or the blaster that would be responsible for um, anything that occurs because of the blasting but the bylaw does say that um, a certificate of insurance with the blasting permit application the applicant has to submit a certificate of insurance which provides a policy of commercial general liability in the amount of at least $5 million per occurrence. So there is a requirement for insurance. Um, I would also say that this pre-blast survey is probably a really important step for the, 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 if anything, this is probably the most important element, I think, in this bylaw is that it gives those residents that baseline to understand, you know, if blasting occurs, they have that record to show where you know there may have been cracks in the foundation already before the blasting so they'll have that baseline there um and i think the bylaw actually does say that notification is let me just check i think it's four days um yeah so as part of the bylaw there the blaster has to provide or the applicant has to provide at least four days prior to the commencement of blasting so it's not just the day before the blast in bylaw, just as another side note there in terms of notification, um, if the blasting is within 300 metres of a school or a hospital or other healthcare facility, the blaster is actually required to give notice before um, uh, there are at least two hours prior to each blast. So whereas the residents get notice before commencement of the blasting, the school or healthcare facility gets notice prior to each blast. Anyway, I, um, I think all of those elements, in my opinion, does provide that ability for residents to have that information if they want to take some action against the blaster. Does that satisfy your question? Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Green. I would move the recommended motion. Second. It's moved and second. Any comments? Questions being called, we'll go to the vote. And the votes pass unanimously. Next item on the agenda is the plan update, funding erosion zone supplemental report. Debbie or Rachel, who's... Uh... Debbie will be doing the main presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. 
just a minute. Yes, Councilor Musa. You want to go over my seat? Or Michael's? Just a minute. Oh, sorry. How's that? Better? Okay. Okay, Debbie, commence. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So at their March meeting of the council, uh, motion C2393 was passed regarding the plan update. Um, it was moved that council direct staff to bring back a report to a future planning advisory committee meeting to look at the erosion floodplain zones and to include the maps for 2050 and 2100 flood line scenarios and look at options, non-permanent structures for landowners on the shore to maximize opportunities for the land. Um, so this report has additional information and images that have been included to assist members of planning advisory committee in deciding how to proceed with the funding erosion, FE designation, and zone policies and regulations. And although the motion uh, mentions flood risk scenarios, based on the discussion at planning advisory committee, we went back and listened to it, staff understood that the intent was to further discuss the erosion zone, so that's what we'll be concentrating on. Um, a detailed review of the Fundy Vulnerability Study was presented by Dr. Tim Webster, research scientist at Nova Scotia Community College's Applied Research Group to uh, Planning Advisory Committee in May of 2022. Uh, you can rewatch re the presentation um, and the staff report and, and um, the Fundy Vulnerability Study um, at the following links. And the study has been posted with this information to show how the coastline of the Bay of Fundy is eroding. Historical coastline positions were generated from geo-referenced aerial photos of the entire study area acquired from Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia Geomatic Center for the years 2013 and 1973. LIDAR was used in place of imagery for the most recent coastal position of 2019. Um, so we have a map at this link here showing where um, all of those lines are posted. So if you wanted to go in and look at that, you can. Um, Erosion rates for 2050 and 2100 are based on historical rates. So we have them plotted here for you. And this is an image out of the actual uh, Fundy Vulnerability Study. And the blue line is shows the 1973 coastline. The yellow line is the 2013 coastline. The red line is the 2019. The green is the 2050 projected coastline. And the pinkish purple here is the 2100 projected coastline. So in between the 1973 and 2013, there's a 40 year difference. In between the 2013 and 2019, there's a six year difference. And in between um, the 2019 and the projected 2050 is a 31 year difference. And you can tell that the erosion rates seem comparable between the 40 year and the 31 erosion rates. So this is totally based on historical trends. And then it is uh, increased to the 2100. Um, and as I mentioned, the erosion rates seem com comparable in between those, those levels there. This is another image from the study and it shows a little bit of armoring along the shoreline. So the erosion rates tend to be a little bit smaller here. Um, but what happens is that adjacent lands, because the water and the wave action goes in behind the armoring and creates issues for the properties next door, you can see that the erosion rates increase for the adjoining properties. Um, and this here is actually uh, a bylaw enforcement case where we had to remove a trailer. Um, so in May of 2019, this is where uh, a trailer was on the property along the road. And in January 2020, we went back out, the bylaw enforcement officer went back out and took another images. And then this is in March of 2021. And this looks like it's snow right up to the edge, but it's actually hanging off the cliff. And this is the just the um, snow down below. So this is it in 2021, at which what at this point the municipality um, we had it removed from the land. 
Uh, this here is an image of shoreline collapse in 2022, and this is in the fall. And this just is uh, to show you that it, the shoreline is eroding, and it's not just eroding a little bit at a time. Um, we're having uh, large parcels of the shoreline erode at one point at along the coast, and um, the building inspector's working with uh, this property owner to, remove, to move some buildings now. So climate change. The erosion rates calculated in the study are based on historic erosion rates and do not take into consideration sea level rise or increased storm events, both of which would impact rates of erosion. Information from the government of Nova Scotia states that Nova Scotia can expect more frequent intense storms. Warming oceans enable tropical storms to move further north without losing strength. When these storms make landfall, they contribute to high-speed winds and powerful storm surges. In changing climate, Nova Scotia is likely to experience more frequent and intense storms. And this is just some information from the province as well, and I've included them in the staff report. Uh, sea level rise is another issue that we have to contend with in Nova Scotia. So um, sea level rise will also have an impact on the eroding coastline. Research projects an increase of up to one meter in relative sea level in Nova Scotia by 2100. Higher sea levels have the potential to damage coastal communities and infrastructure, infiltrate freshwater supplies, and threaten sensitive coastal species and ecosystems. Storm surge and high tides will be more impactful as sea levels rise. So if a steady erosion rate year over year could be predicted, property owners would have time to arrange for their homes to be moved and it would allow them to secure the safety of their families. However, as we know, nature is unpredictable and one storm event could destroy the lives of many. In Port of Ass, post-tropical storm Fiona resulted in the destruction of over 100 homes and the death of one person. According to the National Hurricane Center, a tide gauge in Port of Ass, Newfoundland, measured 2.3 feet above the higher high water large tide. And that basically means is over the past 19 years, they take the highest tide that was recorded and they use that and average it out. And that tide that came in was 2.3 feet above that 19 year average. So that uh, tells you what kind of, uh, what they were dealing with there. Um, considering East Hans now has the data that identifies properties and homes that are at threat of being lost to erosion and coastal flooding, it is recommended that East Hans take a proactive approach to land development instead of allowing more homes to be constructed along the shoreline, which may erode considerably in the future, and are therefore recommending that planning documents remain as drafted. Using the East Hans civic addressing data, we can determine the number and location of homes that are at potentially at risk. There could be other buildings um, which don't have civics. So if you have barns or garages, outbuildings, that type of things, we don't count. We didn't count those in our numbers. So within that Fundy Erosion 2050 um, zone, there area, there's currently 15 um, dwellings that are at risk, and if you go to 2100, there's a 44 additional dwellings at risk. And I know that Maitland was brought up as a, a community that could potentially be at risk. And this is um, from the Fund a Vulnerability Study. So this is the lines without being amended to the zones. Um, so in Maitland, there are potential for flooding. There's potential for erosion. And there are homes and businesses at risk. Um, with our proposed, the, the current proposed regulations show that the erosion zone stopping at the Highway 215, and that's uh, because staff feel or would hope that we would work with Nova Scotia Public Works to make sure that road wasn't compromised, and it would be probably good to start discussions along those lines to determine how we handle um, protecting our infrastructure in the future. Um, alternatives, planning staff recommend that planning advisory committee and council continue with the approach that they have first approved in June of 2022. If councillors are concerned about the data, staff recommend taking a cautious approach and adopting the Fundy flood risk and Fundy erosion policies and regulations as they have been presented in the draft planning documents and also direct staff to budget for LIDAR in an upcoming budget. The new letter will allow for a review of the current rates of erosion. If at that time changes are warranted, they can be completed um, with the support of the additional data. So the data that we have now is the best data we have available to us, and this information should be used to make land use decisions that are appropriate for the Funday shoreline. So there's no newer data than what we have available to us right now. 
Um, if East Hans Council decides not to continue with the Fundy erosion policies and regulations as proposed, staff have prepared an alternative set of policies and regulations that would prevent development in the 2050 erosion area and would only permit development on skids or helical piles in the 2100 erosion area. This option would allow for two zones to be created, the Fundy Erosion Overlay FE 2050 zone and the Fundy Erosion Overlay 2100 zone. No structures are proposed to be constructed in the FE 2050 zone as land in the zone will most likely be eroded in the next 27 years. In the FE 2100 zone, new structures would be permitted by site plan approval only if they are constructed on skids or helical piles, which would allow for the structures to be moved away from the shoreline if necessary. Regulations would also be prevent on-site services from being placed in the FE 2050 zone. Draft policies and regulations for alternative FE zones have been attached as Appendix C to the staff report. So the two alternatives is to maintain the current Fundy flood risk and Fundy erosion overlay zones as presented in the draft planning documents and direct staff to budget for additional LIDAR research on erosion rates. And the second one is the use of the amended fund year erosion policies and regulations as presented in Appendix C of the staff report. Um, was, staff was also asked to uh, provide an update on the Coastal Protection Act. So the Nova Scotia Coastal Protection Act was established to protect natural ecosystems and make sure that new homes and businesses are safer from sea level rise, coastal flooding, and coastal erosion. The Nova Scotia government are still working on regulations to implement the act. To date, the provincial government has completed two consultations with the public and they are now planning a third round of consultation. No date has been provided for the completion of the Coastal Protection Act regulations. And East Hans has requested that where municipalities have created their own regulations that they be exempted from the act or regula and or regulations. Recommendation is that the current proposed Fundy Erosion Overlay policies and regulations are maintained and request that LIDAR is budgeted for in the draft 2024-2025 cycle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, I'm just looking at the recommended motion and also the alternative motion, which comes as a result of um, council requesting that uh, staff go back and give it a second look. Um, so, I'm myself. I'm more in favor of the alternative motion, and I'm also thinking that. If we do have provisions through the Fundy Erosion Overlay designation areas that uh, the province may be more likely to allow us to, uh, to keep our own zoning uh, if they see that we, we have those additional uh, regulations in place rather than just going with the, uh, with the 2050, a straight 2050 outlook. That's my... Uh, that's my observation on it. Thank you. Are you making a alder motion? Okay, so I'm going to make a motion that the Planning Advisory Committee recommend that Council amend the draft East Hans Official Community Plan to include new provisions for the Fundy Erosion Overlay designation and zones as outlined in the staff report presented to Planning Advisory Committee on April 18, 2023. The seconder, second by uh, Public Member Balcom. On before the motion, Deputy Warden Perry. Okay. <laughs> I can say whatever I want now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry, uh, cousin. Uh, Council Musa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I know we have to put some regulations there, but or I think that's a question for CAO. Has there been any talk with other municipality that facing the same problem to, to get the, the province and the federal to do something to protect those own? Like, have, have there been any discussion with other, other municipality? Because I, I, I think if we, I know we can put regulation and stuff, but something have to be done to protect those shores. And I know some other places in the world, they're 
create an island in a short to gain some land and we're losing the land here and we're not doing anything about it. So I don't know if we should be heading that, uh, that something like that and talk to other municipality to do something about it. To, pr to protect, the sh I know we could put regulation on people who live there, but we're not doing anything to protect them. And I think the, the federal government spent a lot of money on something that is not as, as necessary that this one. So I think we should pressure them as a municipalities that live on the shore. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Musa. Uh, Councilor Rhino. Just to the motion or general discussion? But does this, uh, yeah, I, mean, I just want to clarify. So this motion will allow structures to be built on skids and uh, or mo removable things in a certain area around that. It, I just want to clarify that. So you, to you, Mr. Chair, um, it would allow them on skids and helical piles in the 2100 from the 2050 to the 2100 uh, boundary. So just in that area that's... Um, I guess that 50 year zone there. Yeah. I can I can show them on the map that might be more clear help clarify it. Um, so I'm going to just take off our boundaries from 1973. Oh, it's not showing on my screen. Uh, just one sec there. <laughs> there you go. All right. Um, so in the green here is the 2050 would be considered the 2050 um, erosion zone. And there'll be nothing permitted in that area because that area is expected to be um, gone in 27 years. In the, from, the tw so from the edge of that green line there, Mm -hmm. out to the pink would be the 2100 uh, fundy erosion zone. And that's where you'd be permitted to have uh, buildings constructed on skids or helical piles. So you in between the green and the, and the, and the pink or whatever there, that, that's where we could skid? Yeah. Yes. Really? Uh, you know, but making a motion so early within a, within a discussion limits what you can talk about with regards because it doesn't allow for opinions and, and, and other things. But anyway, it is what it is. But uh, uh, I'm glad to see we got that. But honestly, uh, uh, I'll be 90 in 2050 and I hope I'm around to say I told you so because I do not believe in this at, at that amount of, because there, I looked at, I looked at the um, the presentation and went back and I went over that and basically he said there's other there's places along that shore that are not eroding as fast as fast as others but we are more or less to me looks like we were treating treating this all carte blanche along that whole shore is is uh, the same thing and we're basing and they base theirs on what, how much is eroded in the past, divided that by the number of years, and that's what they come up with the erosion rate. I, at some point, I, I do believe that erosion will stop. So I think I've stretched more of my talk on the, on, the, on the thing, but I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Is that all, uh, Councillor? Yes, thank you. Deputy Warden Perry, to the motion? Yes, to the motion, I believe. If not, you can correct me. Um, the, the mover mentioned about putting something in place to fend off the provincial government in their Coastal Protection Act. Um, through, through you to staff, no matter what we do here today, once that Coastal Protection Act comes in, have they given any indication that they would entertain uh, municipalities retaining their policies over a new act? or has there been no dialogue on that as of yet? Because uh, I know on Prince Edward Island, they did it carte blanche and overruled everybody. Uh, New Brunswick has done something very similar. Nova Scotia says they're 
supposed to be in this third round, consulting municipalities is one of the is one of the stakeholders. I just want to know if they if they've contacted us yet or not. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, there has been dialogue, but it's been kind of one way from us to them. Um, not much feedback on our proposal. Uh, however, they have paused the regulation implementing anything and are doing another round of consultation. So I guess we should be hopeful that you know something may come out of that round. Yeah, I, I just worry that we're we're going to do this and think we've done something great, and then it can all just go away at a stroke of a pen. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Councillor Rhino. Um, a topic like this uh, d deserves a little more d discussion as well. But that's uh, that's my thoughts as close to the motion as I can stay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor Garden Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So it is to the motion. I'd like to withdraw the motion for the simple reason that when it was hasty when I made it, um, and I didn't have proper understanding of it, I thought that you were saying that up to 2050 was going to be as it is, and that it was going to be, I saw a development agreement, that the rest was going to be as through a development agreement, property by property, depending on whether they were, looked like they were really in a really vulnerable area or not, but that's not the case. No. Go ahead, Debbie. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. So in that green area there, it would be, um, no development at all, and that's because that area is going to erode within the next 27 years. Mm -hmm. And uh, within the pink area, it would be by site plan approval, so not necessarily development agreements. So you wouldn't have to come to council. It would just be site plan approval. As long as you were on helical piles or skids or, or whatnot, then you could get a site plan approval to do it. It wouldn't be development agreement. Unless the shore's armored. So I guess there's another aspect, which is in the current regulations as well. If you go in and just say, I don't, I don't know, this property owner here wanted to develop down here, under the current regulations, and it would be under the, the ones that are proposed as well as the alternative, somebody could armor the shoreline here and provide us with a study, is that correct? And do it by development agreement and they could have that, their structure closer to the property line um, in both of those situations because you would have done the study and you would have armored your shoreline and completed any engineering work that needed to be undertaken. But other than that, everything from the green to the pink would have to be, um, as you referred to it, on whatever that could, would be movable. And that's the part that I didn't have a clear understanding on when I hastily yes. made that motion. Um, do you, Mr. Chair, could I also just mention one other thing? So the municipality is already paid to have one uh, structure removed from the coastline. If we're going to allow additional structures within that 27 year period, I think we should budget for having to remove more structures in the future. Because some people, if they have no property left, they'll simply walk away from their land and their structures that they have on that land. So it is another aspect of it to take into consideration. Thank you, David, for that clarification. You withdraw your motion? With the approval of the seconder. Seconder, you approve? So the motion Thank has you. been withdrawn from the floor, so we're now back to the re presentation. Oh, presentation, sorry. Uh, Councilor Tingley. Uh, through the chair, uh, my problem with that diagram up there is we're betting that the uh, erosion is only going to go to the green line. And that's based on historical uh, data, not taking into account the increased storm surges, um, the uh, uh, oceans are getting higher, um, all the things that contribute to erosion. Uh, I think it's fairly well known that erosion is going to increase. It's not going to decrease. So it would be a fluke if the erosion stopped at that green line by 2027. Uh, I, I, just, I think that's just wishful thinking and, and you know, ho hoping that uh, that happens, or in 27 years. Um, so I, I'm more uh, thinking that we should be planning on that 2100 uh, line if we're, if we're going to uh, exercise uh, some caution here. That's, that's just my thought. Uh, I don't feel comfortable with... Uh, um, based on what uh, Dr. Webster has said, and uh, Deputy Warden um, Perry talked about the, 
what PEI are doing. I read a report that was done for them that they expect erosion to be uh, one and a half to two times as great going forward as it has been in the past because of all these changes with the climate. So I, I'm more comfortable with that 2100 line, but that's, that's all I have to say. Thank you, Councillor Tingley. Uh, Councillor Rhino. Could we go up to, um, do you have anything along up there? Do you have any line up along there that we can view? Because I'm just more interested to see <clears throat> where that's gonna fall. Um, and it's not the wrong end. Gravity domes, um, do you know up what community that's in? Up the 215 there, up from Maitland, between South Maitland and Maitland. South Maitland, okay. Well, it's not in South Maitland, close to it. I don't know their exact location, but I think they're along the river here somewhere, are they not? Yeah, go up. I, I guess you'd go down. Uh, somewhere, so, okay, go, just take your cursor and go back up. I'm thinking it's right where that, on the left-hand side of the 250, right, right up a little bit more, right there. I think they're in that vicinity or along there. So can you get any closer in, zoom that in? All right, so if right now, We've got, I think it is four to five dome, gravity domes on there who are uh, putting, uh, uh, for, for tourism, tourism, they're a great catch. Uh, apparently, if this goes, then we will not be, if it goes back to the pink, we will not be able to, to add anything more there. If that goes, uh, it's gonna decrease tourism. Uh, it, 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 it basically renders anybody that's got land on the right hand side going down the shore on the 215 basically useless and a great portion of it and really I would I would like to see put minimal requirements in there so we can use our land until it comes to such a point that we we say okay in so many years we're we've got to do something and move this zone back or something because right now is this go if this goes you just may as well it's useless land it's totally useless land and we want to try to encourage people to come down through there and and do the tourism that's all we have in the Hanstorms area and if we limit potentials on things like gravity domes or, or cabins along that shore and I know there's probably cabins down along that round burn coat area or down the Moose Brook area. I'd be interested to see how close they are, but right there, it's, I, it's just, I understand there's erosion. I just don't agree with the rate of erosion. And uh, I'd read, rather see minimal things put in there so we can use that land up until uh, close to the time that uh, it may see where it ends up with erosion wise. So that's just my two cents worth. Um, so, and I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you, Councilor Rhino. Any comments? Um, so you, you, Mr. Chair, through the alternative um, motion, they would still be able to put the things on helical piles or on uh, skids in the pink area here. So they, the alternative motion would, would grant them in between the pink and the green? Through you, Mr. Chair, yes. That alternative motion says nothing within this green out to the shore. And between that green line and, well, in this case, the road right here or the pink up here, you'd be permitted by site plan approval to have a structure on helical piles or skids. So what would that do to the, to the current... Uh, structures that are there now because just up from that I know we have uh, a private uh, family campground there just for themselves uh, will what will those be grandfathered to leave alone or, or how 
human shares, the same with any other land use, um, they would be considered lawfully existing uses. So if that use is there and that built structure is there, they can stay there. We wouldn't ask them to move their structures. So in like going back there, so if those gravity domes, I'm not just sure where they're on, but I'm thinking they're in somewhere between that green and the pink. That would be allowed. Would that be allowed for extension of those gravity domes if they want to put two or three more in? Through you, Mr. Chair, if they put them on helical piles or skids. Which, yeah. Yes, and we also have a provision in both sets of regulation, proposed regulations that would allow any house, for example, if this was a house here and it burnt down, that they could rebuild, they couldn't get any closer to the shoreline, but it's the same as, as other non-conforming uses. If your structure is destroyed by fire or otherwise, then you can um, rebuild it. Well, if that's a prediction for 20, 20, 2100, there's going to be roads gone. There's going to be everything gone. I, uh, you know, I have no crystal ball, but I do not see that. Not at that, not at that rate, not at that amount. And uh, scientist or no scientist, you know, it's just, uh, that's just my feelings. But to me, you're, we're, we're rendering land vir virtually useless. Is that all, Councilor Rhino? Thank you. Councilor McPhee, you're next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe that probably that those lines aren't correct. I think it's going to erode faster than that, probably, as Councillor Tingley said. The green Greenland ice cap is melting. It's melting faster. We're getting soot on it. There's a whole lot of reasons due to climate change. Um, it's just amazing how the Greenland ice sheet is melting. It's way faster than what anybody thought when they really seriously thought about this 50 years ago, 30 years ago, or 20 years ago. Uh, at the time that I first heard of, really got involved or thought, thought about this would be in the early 70s. And they were saying then their projections up to 2000 were pretty good, which they were. They didn't, but they thought the increase at that time, the speed of the change would be, would increase so much that they couldn't predict it then. Well, I think that's what we're seeing now. We're also seeing massive uh, ice sheets in Antarctica collapsing. Uh, sea levels have to rise. When sea levels rise and ice caps collapse, land sinks. So there's a good chance that those lines are wrong. That pink line's going to be achieved probably before 2100. Uh, as a liability for the municipality, we should think about allowing people to build on land that's not supportable. Obviously, anything outside of the green line, I would say. Um, if we can allow people to put them on heel piles, skids, or some other way to move their buildings, I could see that. That needs to be built into the regulations so that we, municipality councils in the future won't be dealing with this as a liability issue. So we need to protect the taxpayers in this municipality by... Uh, making sure we get this right. I'm not saying we shouldn't use that land because it's going to be a while before it erodes, but it is going to erode. I don't think the province, unless they've really come ahead, are really looking at or have any idea of the impact of erosion on roads such as the 215 and in other parts of this uh, province. The number two, when you go up through Advocate Harbor, there's a perfect example. What are you going to do about Advocate Harbor? You're going to leave because it's going to disappear. So, uh, and that's just across the bay. <laughs> so, uh, now with the recommended motion, are people allowed to build in that pink zone then on helical piles or skids or a movable type structure? To you, Mr. Chair, uh, no. The, uh, they'd only be allowed to do so by development agreement by um, shoring up that shore. So they'd have to armor the shore. Armor the shore or do whatever is. else they needed to do in order yeah. to protect their structures. Yes, to armor that effectively would be. I don't think that's doable either. So anyway, very good. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor.
Councilor Eisner. Thank you, Mr. Chair, to you, the staff. Has there ever been uh, money given back to the residents for loss of land from taxes? That's for um, taxing on the land base, I believe. Um, so you, Mr. Chair, we asked a question to PVSC uh, for our last report that talked about um, whether you could p appeal your taxes based on what we sold your property. And I think they would look at it at a case-by-case -case scenario. So they didn't say outright no. What they would have to do is look at it at a case-by-case -case scenario, and you could put, potentially appeal your, your tax assessment. Yeah, sorry, that's what I meant. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Eisner. Uh, Deputy Warden Perry. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. In agreement with um, Councillor McPhee about protecting the municipality, um, how many structures in the last number of years have we had to remove already due to erosion? Say five, five, five to ten years as a ballpark. Through you, uh, Mr. Chair, we've only removed one. That was under a dangerous or unsightly premises order. Um, there may have been some removed or pulled back privately. That's the only one I think the municipality was involved with. Because okay. this is going to become an issue as we go forward. <coughs> and and it, there is, you know, um, Councillor Tingley brought up st storm surges. I mean, this is a tidal area. This is a whole tidal portion. So when water rushes in and water rushes out, it naturally takes something with it. Um, but I mean, if it comes in on a high tide and we get a storm, that's what happened in Port of Bass. And it was only 2.3 feet higher than the highest tide that ever came in. It caused that much damage. Uh, I really hope uh, that the Coastal Protection Act that, that's coming in and uh, hopefully we'll have good consultation with will be something that will help protect the coast and, and fend off some of these erosion zones, maybe allow for armoring at a reduced price and things like that, which will allow residents to be able to use their land fully for a longer period of time. Um, the, that's the big, to me, that's the big red herring right now is we don't know what the province is going to impose. So whatever we put out here today, right, could be gone tomorrow. And, and I, I, me personally, I feel you know, maybe bud budgeting for the LIDAR just to see what the newest cycle is, get the newest data, um, because that's really what we have to make decisions based on is empirical data, right? If you have data from, you know, modern data, not from pictures, but the LIDAR from 2016 or 2019, and you can compare it to 2024, you can then see over that six years what the actual erosion was during that period, and that might give us a better picture. Um, but I do believe we have time because there is so many other regulations that are coming. Uh, we need to get this right um, for both the protection of the municipality, the protection of the residents, and the and the ability of the residents that currently have land there to provide them with options that they can use it um, and and, vi and viable ones. And I just feel without knowing what the Coastal Protection Act is going to be and what. Those, instruct, those restrictions will be placed on landowners of coastal properties ahead of time. I feel we're kind of almost putting the cart before the horse, right? I mean, once that regulation comes out, it's going to supersede anything that we do. We, I mean, I can pretty much guarantee the province is not going to say, East Hanch, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. If we look at the way things are going, it's they want to, the whole province has got to be protected the same way. So I, I, I firmly believe that that that's what's going to happen and then we're going to have to react to do the best interest of our residents after we understand what that regulation is going to be um, so, so and that's that's my opinion uh, so i really don't see either of these motions really having the designed effect that we want to have for the residents of this area or the protection of the municipality until we know what the overwhelming recommendation is going to be of the province and the restrictions the province are going to be placed on all landowners along the coastline for the entire coast of Nova Scotia. The only thing we really can control right now is actually budget to get more data so we can have more information to make informed decisions rather than guessing if we're going to be able to do this motion or that motion and then it all be changed within six months to ten months and then we're back here again. 
and we're wasting staff's time, we're wasting effort, and we're wasting all this stuff. So it's, it's very difficult for me to even get behind either one of these motions at this point due to the fact there is a bigger change coming in play with the Coastal Protection Act. And it, they, they said it is going to come out by the end of this year, and there is going to be new regulations going into 2024. So that's where I sit on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I could respond to a couple things there. Um, in terms of we, the comment about we have time, I mean, we're, we're hoping to get some direction from a committee and council so that we can move forward to a public hearing on the uh, plan update and, and complete that project. So there is some timely element to that. And as far as the Coastal Protection Act goes, it certainly could happen that the province comes in with a set of regulations that you know are you know 180 degrees different than what we're doing. In a case like that, the more stringent regulations would take precedent. I mean, there are other areas where the municipality and the province regulate. I don't think that's the end of the world. And you know, I, I guess it could be some um, energy and time that we spent on something that could set aside. But then again, the province may never do it or maybe 10 years before they do something. So in our view, you know, after we did the study, it just seemed like a prudent approach to move forward. Thank you. That satisfy your <clears throat> question? Yeah, and, and, I, and I totally agree with you, through you, Mr. Chair, to, uh, to the director. It, but for this Coastal Protection Act, because of the, the weight that's coming post all the storms, post, post coming what's coming up, the fact that all the neighbors are are getting on to that. Um, you know, it's already in Prince Edward Island. I believe New Brunswick is, I don't know if New Brunswick has finalized theirs yet or not, but 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 they have one definitely coming as well that uh, the coastal areas are definitely gonna be, need to be protected in some way. There's a lot of pressure coming from other municipalities towards the province to get this done sooner than later. So I, I don't think it's gonna be quite the 10 year mark, but I, I do think it's, it's gonna come and yes, Seeing that this is part of the plan update, which has to come out, so yes, there is there is that time constraint. Um, I just I just don't know if we need to make any massive changes to the plan right now, um, and we can. If there's a way to earmark this that you know, okay, nothing's really happening right now, but we can revisit this to make that change at a later date once we have the, the more data and the more information that allows us to make an informed decision. Um, we have great data here already. However, there's that other big piece of about the higher regulatory body, you know, pending regulations. But, and that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Uh, Councilor Rhino. Yeah, can we go back to that green and pink deer lines there, if you don't mind? Okay. So if the alternative motion would allow uh, things to be put in that pink area without de development agreement and without armoring the shore? Uh, so you, Mr. Chair, correct, you would need site plan approval, which is um, basically as of right, you just have to submit your plans showing what you're doing. And uh, everybody within 30 meters gets notification, mm -hmm. but the development officer makes the decision and what usually takes three weeks, John? Yeah, three or four weeks. Well, I guess it's my thought then, you know, with this, you know, pending coastal thing coming out from the province is, you know, let's not, let's let the people use that, that land for the foreseeable future. And then if legislation comes out that limits that, then that's on the province. That's not on us. Because people are going to see this and they're going to see is my land is useless for the next when I could be using it for the next 50 years. So I'm gonna, with that, I'm gonna move the alternative motion that allows for what I just said, uh, um, no development agreement and uh, no armoring. So I so move. Seconder? Second. Move and second. Uh, thank you, Councilor Rhino. On before the motion, Councilor Tingley. Uh, through the chair, I just want to comment to the staff. I, I think you were very prudent in bringing this forward, um, and uh, we're we're having a pretty informed discussion around it. And bringing Dr. Webster in here to speak and that sort of thing, uh, I, I just made a, a couple of notes here. Um, 
listening to doc, doc, Dr. Webster, he talked about the ocean level. It's the rise is increasing faster. Uh, the uh, he talked about the sediment. Uh, I don't think we fully understand what's going on with the sediment in the in the basin. Like is is that increasing? Uh, and the the severity of the storms. Uh, I mean, there's other things I don't think that was talked about, like the shape of the the Bay of Fundy and the effect that that has. And we're basically talking about the climate, but uh, you can have a weather event, one of one of weather event that could come in and blow half of this right out of here uh, if you get the right uh, conditions. Um, so uh, I just want to commend you on the work that you've you've done on this. Uh, uh, Dr. Webster mentioned that you're getting ahead of it. I don't know what the province's uh, coastal uh, protection act is going to state. But no doubt they'll download the responsibility of, uh, of planning and zoning down on the municipality. So you're going to have to do this either now or later. And the fact that you're doing it now I, is, is pretty impressive to me. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you, Councillor Tingley. Nobody else requesting to speak or as you wish? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion has been passed, uh, 10 to 2, with Councillor McPhee and, Co and uh, Deputy Warden Perry voting nay. Thank you, staff, for that report. No. Yeah, Last item under planning advisory is sheds and front yards. And uh, Director Woodford is doing that. When you're ready, John. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is follow up to uh, your meeting last month. Um, and going back to, I guess, really um, early on in the plan update, um, there was a staff report that came forward regarding accessory structures in front yards. Uh, under current regulations, accessory structures are not permitted in front yards of areas where you have municipal services. And at that time, back in July 2021, council passed a motion which directed staff to maintain the current regulations. Subsequently, an affected property owner who's dealing with enforcement action from the municipality requested a second review uh, be taken. And so council did consider that request last month and directed staff to bring the matter back again for another look. So this report looks at some options for dealing with that uh, discussion. Um, so accessory structures are not permitted in front yards of serviced areas. It's really for aesthetic reasons. You've got much smaller lots. And I guess at some point there's a practical issue of fitting accessory structures in front of your dwelling, but where they're much more obvious, again, with smaller lots where houses are closer to the street, it's really an aesthetic issue. Um, so option A would simply be to confirm the direction previously provided by council on the issue. <clears throat> and that would have the benefit of treating all properties within the service areas equally. Staff would then proceed with enforcement action on any accessory structures not in compliance with the land use bylaw. Option B would be to permit existing accessory structures to remain. So I've crafted a, a clause that could be added to the land use bylaw here. And that would essentially um, grandfather any existing ones that are out there. Um, so when uh, on the date that your new planning documents come into effect, any sheds or, or other accessory structures that are in front yards in your serviced areas would be able to uh, stay. Um, now, I, I think the benefit of that would be that you would deal with some of those hardship cases you may have heard about, and at the same time, you wouldn't open the door to any, any new cases by going with that option. Option C would be to, <clears throat> I guess, try to come up with some rules to allow new accessory structures in front yards. And this, um, this was taken from your report back in July 2021, where we talked about um, a minimum, a large, a much larger minimum lot size than is normally permitted in the serviced areas, a dwelling that's further back from the street, like 30 meters, um, and a limit on the size of the accessory building. Um, 
at the time, council never really, I guess, closed the loop on that discussion, and I staff weren't really recommending the approach anyway. Um, and <clears throat> one of the concerns, I think, would be if you did this, there may be some of those accessory structures out there right now that actually wouldn't meet this new test. Um, so as a result, staff are not recommending that approach uh, be pursued at this time either. So uh, there are three options there. Um, if PAC is inclined to permit accessory structures within front yards, staff are recommending option B over C, as it would enable existing structures to remain while not opening the door to new requests within increasingly urbanizing areas of East Hants. <clears throat> so the recommendation is simply that PAC examine those three options and provide direction to staff. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, John. <clears throat> We have three recommendations. What is your wish? Councilor Green. I would move option B. A second. Seconder for option B. Moved and second. Uh, Councilor Ronnie, you're on for the uh, motion, so we'll give you some leeway. Just a minute. Thank Go you. ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I understand option B. Is there, I guess through you to, to staff, or, or is there anyone else that we know of in the serviced area that have the lot's size and, and the structure at the back of the lot similar to what we had with regard to that uh, other situation? There are, through you, Mr. Chair, we know there there are a handful, I think, I, probably fewer than five out there that exist now, but there are, there is more than one, I know that, that exist in front yards right now. So there's nothing we could do. Now, and like I say, I'm, I'm, I don't have any water and sewer in mind, but it seems to be common sense that if you have the land and can put that outside the confines of your house, similar to what we had in this, we talked about in this last one. I, I you know, with this, yeah, it's grandfathered, but if anybody else wanted to do that and, and head the area, I feel that, you know, we should, they should be able to do that, not plunk it in the middle of the yard. Yeah, they, that's a difference. But that one was towards on the side of the driveway, with wasn't even in front of the house. And, and uh, I just wanted to know if there's a way we could uh, create something there that, that would give them the option with, for these large lots with these uh, structures to the back of the lot, a, a lot. Because you're limited with the back of the lot. So. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, so that, that would be the option C, where you would allow us to consider um, new accessory structures in front yards. But again, there's a number of uh, things to meet there. The... Uh, what we set out there was a minimum lot size of 0.5 hectares. Uh, the main uh, dwelling be set back a minimum of 30 meters from the property line. The accessory building not be greater than 7.5 square meters. Um, and, not, and that the building not be directly located in front of the main dwelling, as was the case uh, that you talked about. Um, and not be permitted closer uh, to the front or side property line than the requirements of the main dwelling. So whatever the minimum front end side yard would be. Um, again, staff aren't really recommending that because it is an area where the lots are getting smaller and getting, and some of those larger lots are getting subdivided. Um, it's just an urbanizing area and it's just, mm -hmm. you know, we don't think it's the best way forward other than to deal with the existing ones. No, I can understand why you wouldn't want them in the plunk with the small lot plunked in, right in front. That that that's a no-brainer. But with the larger lots that are existing, you, you know, to me, I prefer them having the option to to to, you know, do something with that. Thank you. Thank you, Castor. Thank you, Deputy Warden Perry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through through, through you to staff. How many current structures are we talking about that are being grandfathered in currently? It, through you, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure exactly, but it's a handful. It's, it's, a handful. it's I think, on one hand. Okay, because I'm, I'm thinking of this, and I'm also thinking about um, in the serviced area, uh, the number of developments that are coming up. We get snow in these tents, right? And if you have no place to put a snowblower, right, it's very difficult to remove snow or, or anything like that. So I was 
just wanted to know um, when looking at the current structures and the projected structures um, for available storage of snow removal slash, uh, you know, if your if your building only gives you two or three feet on either side of your property line or whatever, and the structures in the back, well, you can't get that equipment to the front yard to clean your driveway. You can't get it to clean your front yard uh, grass and, and 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 do the upkeep, which is required as well. So it's was was there any look at what's coming forward to see if this could become an issue again in another three to five years as development happens where people need that extra storage space? Um, through Mr. Chair, no. Um, I mean, uh, many of the new homes have garages so people can put their stuff there. Um, and the lots are getting so much smaller that, you know, the distance to the side yard isn't that far. So, um, no, it, it hasn't come up other than these legacy cases. And, and the final thing, when, when it talks about um, a shed or structure, is there a minimum size for it to be considered a shed? Um, some people buy those, you know, they're, they're three by five <coughs> with a double door, like from Costco or something like that, and they slide something in their bicycle, something in the front yard, and they put a lock on it so their bikes are safe, um, things like that. Would that be considered a shed? Or what is, what is the definition that we're currently using for that? So through you, Mr. Chair, um, there, there's a minimum square footage, uh, I think it's 100 square feet, um, where you require a permit. But below that, it's still considered a structure and, and should meet their required setbacks. But I mean, if you've got a three foot by two foot little plastic thing on your side yard or, you know, even in your front yard, you know, unless somebody complains about it, we're probably not going to know about it. Okay. No, that, that, that's all I have. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Garden Cole, to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chair, through you. Um, I think that the fact that we already have this bylaw in place, I think it would be um, redundant to, to go backwards on it. Um, the sheds can be, how far, the sheds can be level or just set back just from the back of the property, from the back of the structures and homes, is that correct? Um, Yes, it, it can be in line with the house, but has to be beside the house. So it could be yeah. right next to your driveway, yes. right at the end of your driveway. You come out and yeah. start snow blowing. So I would, I really wouldn't want to see this, um, this turn back to where it was before. But I agree that with the motion that um, we could grandfather in the current, up to a half dozen or whatever that are that are currently there. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Garden Cole. Nobody else wishing to speak. What did you wish? Question been called. We'll go to the vote. And the motion is passed 11 to 1 with uh, Councilor Ryder voting nay. That concludes the planning and advisory committee for today. Looking for a motion to adjourn. Moved and second. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carried. We are adjourned. The microphone was off. There you go.
Fire training funding. The fire service funding policy must be updated to allow the fund to be used for specialized training and guest speakers. The Corporate Residential Services Committee recommend to Council that Council give notice of intent to approve the policy amendments to the fire service funding policy as attached to the April 18th Corporate Residential Services Committee agenda. As Chair of the Committee, I so move. Moved and seconded. Questions, Questions would call. We'll go to the vote. Just waiting for, well, that's it. The votes are in and it's passed unanimously. As chair of the committee, I move the adoption of this report. All those in favor? Aye. Motion carried. Next on the agenda, the COVID-19 property tax funding financing program policy repeal. And we'll turn it over to Director of Finance, Sue. Thank you, Chair. So for those that aren't familiar, there is a COVID-19 property tax financing program uh, policy in place that came into place in 2020. And um, it was to provide temporary financing um, loans for those that were having difficulty during the initial COVID period to uh, assist them with their property taxes. So um, that program uh, got rolled out and uh, was initiated and there were a few people that partook in that particular program. There were many people initially that were interested, but what happened as we went along um, throughout the program, the uh, provincial and federal uh, governments came forward with other funding sources that people took advantage of, so weren't necessarily needing to use this. But this did allow those who were struggling to get into a loan arrangement with the municipality through council, through their approval of this program, to help them pay their taxes during that COVID period when many people were um, out of work or having uh, difficulties um, as far as their finances go. So that program just completed in March, March 31st, 2023. All of the loans that we issued are now paid in full. So um, today I'm here just looking to see um, and recommend that council rescind this particular policy as the program's completed now. And um, there's really not a need to maintain this policy. So there's some background there if anybody had an opportunity to look at it and also the policy was attached to the agenda. There's some details on um, the specifics of the program, how it was rolled out, how it came into being. Um, the NSFM uh, it helped us to be able to, to roll this out and create the policy and the program and to help with applications for it. And so um, the only real alternatives would be to keep this policy in place for future use, which um, staff aren't necessarily recommending that today or to give us alternative um, direction for other considerations. And the motion for your consideration is that um, move that the Corporate and Residential Services Committee recommend that Council give notice of intent that Council rescind the COVID-19 property tax financing program policy. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Sue. First up to speak, Councilor Green. I would move the recommended motion. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Question. Question's been called. We'll go to the vote. The votes are in and it is passed unanimously. Thank you, Sue. Thank you. Move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Seconded. All those in favor? 